Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, coming from the wild and wacky world of American evangelicalism, specifically from pastoring a non-denominational church before becoming Lutheran, we attracted people with all kinds of religious backgrounds. Among our membership, we're, there were lapsed Catholics wanting more Bible. There were plenty of Southern Baptists, some Presbyterians, and even those who grew up in Pentecostal circles. They believe that speaking in tongues, which is nothing more than a learned behavior and sounds like gibberish if you've heard it, that was evidence of the Holy Spirit's work among them. Now this practice was not encouraged at our church, mind you, but every so often I would hear them whisper in their private prayer language. Now look, I am talking about people who are salt of the earth. I could trust them with anything I owned. My point is, everyone in our church grew up in different, or having different beliefs. They were Christian, but they were all catechized differently. Most were not catechized at all, which I guess is a form of catechism in and of itself. Now, to be sure, everyone in our church shared many of the same beliefs. To become a member, you had to agree with our core doctrines. But I'll let you in on a little secret. All this is true in every non-denominational church that you see. The core doctrines of any non-denominational church are kept vague on purpose. The chief goal of any non-denominational church is growth. And they would say evangelism. So you want to have as many people as possible. And since doctrine, you ever heard this? Doctrine divides, as they say. The non-denominational church just can't afford to push anyone away. Boy, it sounds noble these days, doesn't it? Good, right, and salutary, we might even say. But there are consequences to such a philosophy, consequences to such a practice of keeping the core doctrines vague. For instance, when it comes to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work, the truth seems very, very hard to come by. One person believed one thing about the Holy Spirit, and another person believed something else entirely different. And like as the pastor, I knew this. Here's a Reformed guy who's attending our church, and here is a, you know, a blood-bought, demon-chasing, holy ghost-rolling, Bible-thumping, whatever guy over here, and these guys would be in a Bible study together. And I know it's what's getting ready to come. The subject of the Holy Spirit would come up, and I know where he stands, and I know where he stands, and I'm like trying to get in there just to make the peace. Here is what the American evangelical, though, does not understand, but you do, or at least you should. It all boils down to how the goods are distributed to us. We understand that that which was won for us on the cross, in the tomb, in the resurrection, and in the ascension of Jesus is the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. We know this. Those are the goods. But how are those goods then distributed? Because what Jesus did took place a long time ago at a land far, far away. Are the goods distributed by what one feels on the inside? Absolutely not, because our feelings are what? They're fallen. One day they'll be glorified, but today they're still fallen. If the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to take what belongs to Christ, namely His righteousness, 
his forgiveness and the victory over death and the grave and deliver all of that to us, how does it happen? Well, folks, that's why we celebrate Pentecost. For on day 50, day 50 after Easter, the Holy Spirit is given. And it is a complete reversal of what took place at Babel. You already heard the Old Testament read into your ears. What took place? They came together, it says very clearly, they had one language. But they came together with nefarious purposes so much so that God confused their language. And then at Pentecost, what happens? Now you've got a bunch of people from all, it even lists the places that they came from. It says the languages they spoke. And they all began to speak in one language, i.e. the apostles, that is, they spoke what? The gospel. It's absolutely beautiful. And when the Holy Spirit is given to us, we hear and we believe and we live according to God's Word. Now listen, it's more than you care to know, but way back in the days of Moses, while the Israelites were complaining about having uh, to wander around in the desert and hating on the food that God provided, the Lord told Moses to select, to select 70 men, i.e. elders, and just listen to the text. Then the Lord came down in the cloud. Remember the cloud from last week? The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him, that is Moses, and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, they preached. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered but they had not gone out of the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man came in to Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua the son of man, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, and here's the point, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. That, my friends, is why we have Pentecost. The Holy Spirit being given to all. We spend seven weeks in the Easter season and everything is white, and then today everything turns red for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to all just as Moses hoped that one day that it would happen. Yet, as I said earlier, it all comes down to the way in which the goods are distributed. The Holy Spirit is given to Jesus' disciples specifically to use their preaching to kindle a fire, red, to kindle a fire on earth, spreading the kingdom of Christ in the hearts of mankind. And as you know, on that day, 3,000 believed and were baptized. Sins were forgiven. New creations are coming up from the water left and right. The church then continued to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, being sanctified and renewed day by day. How, though? How? The church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread. That wasn't, that wasn't uh, potluck dinners. The breaking of bread and in the prayers. Beloved, this is how the Holy Spirit works. He ties Himself to these means. He binds Himself to the preaching of Christ and to the sacraments. And this is why we preach. This is why we gather as a church around the Holy Sacraments. This is why we confess our sins and we thirst for the holy absolution. It's why we come to Bible study. It's why we come to catechesis. For in all places where the Word of God goes forth, the Holy Spirit is always to be found, and He binds Himself there for you. I've had people say to me before, these are people who are still in the Pentecostal uh, circles, uh, they might say to you or to me as a Lutheran, they might say something like, you put the Holy Spirit in a box. You ever heard that? You put the Holy Spirit in a box. To 
in which I say, no, the Holy Spirit put himself there. What was in the Old Testament? As, as, as the priests came together and as they worshiped the Lord, there was a what? There was a box! It's called the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where God said, I will meet you here. I put myself there. This is what the Holy Spirit has done. But the American evangelicals just simply do not see it this way. They tend to look for the Holy Spirit apart from His Word, somewhere other than His sacraments, hoping to find Him elsewhere, like in their circumstances or in their feelings or in mystical experiences. We've already sung it today. It was one of the hymns, the first one. I don't even know if you noticed this. Let's see if I can find it real quick. It's our first hymn, uh, 874, stanza 5. Just listen. On Christ, the true bread, let us feed. Let Him to us be drink indeed. And let us taste with joyfulness the Holy Spirit's plenteousness. Where can you find the Holy Spirit? Wherever God's Word is preached, wherever His sacraments are administered, the Holy Spirit has tied Himself to these things, which is so wonderful and so freeing. Why? Because guess what? We know where to find Him. If you don't know that He's tied Himself to His Word and His sacraments, you will go looking all kinds of places, and folks have done it. You will go looking for God and His Holy Spirit in all kinds of places that He never promised to be. He comes along and He says, if you want to find me, this is where I am. And I am there for you. With what? Forgiveness, life, and salvation. And so the apostles continued to preach and the members of the church continued to hear. The apostles then baptized and they administered the sacrament of the altar. The Holy Spirit was in it all, bringing people to the knowledge of Jesus, to His death and to His resurrection, to His promise of life and forgiveness. For this is what the Holy Spirit is tasked with, taking the gifts of Jesus that He won for us on the cross and distributing them freely. Folks, think of the Holy Spirit as the FedEx man without the shipping cost. He delivers the goods. When the, Holy, when the apostles, rather, the holy apostles, when they died, the Holy Spirit did not skip a beat. The apostles were replaced with pastors doing the exact same thing that the apostles were doing. Now, we call them church fathers. And you can read all about the church fathers. But then the church fathers, guess what happened to the church fathers? They what? They died. Did the Lord leave himself without a witness? Never. So the church fathers were replaced by other pastors so that more people around the world would hear the gospel, they would repent, they would believe that calling them out of darkness into the light of the kingdom of the Son of God. Folks, by the work of the Holy Spirit, you have had to heard the word of the cross and you have believed the promise that all of your sins are forgiven. This is not your own doing. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that there's a church here on this hilltop. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that there's a font right there, that there's an altar right over there, that there's an open Bible right there, that there's a pulpit right here. All of it is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been working the same way for nearly 2,000 years years, working through the Word to create and sustain faith in God and love for the neighbor. So, let all of the American evangelicals waste their lives looking for the Holy Spirit where He's not promised to be, and let them continue to make up their own versions of what the Holy Spirit does, for we simply do not have a better explanation of the Holy Spirit's work than the exp explanation that is found in the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I want you to say it and I want us to recite it together. Take your hymn one more time and turn to 323.
323, under the section entitled the third article. Key word for this article is sanctification. Let us say the third article of the creed together. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That sums up the work of the Holy Spirit right there, but Luther goes a little further. What does this mean together? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, He daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, He will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Yes, it is. This is most certainly true. This is what the Holy Spirit has done for you. This is what the Holy Spirit has done in you and for you. It's what He continues to do and it's what He will continue to do even unto life eternal. So, on this festival of Pentecost, we give thanks to God Almighty, praying as well that the Spirit of God would make us wise to understand the Word of Christ, make us bold to confess the name of Christ, and eager to walk in the commandments of Christ until He comes again. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.